Hello and welcome. It is a beautiful day in sunny Los Angeles. This is the Nicholas Natale Show. I am your host, Nicholas Natale. Each week, I meet with individuals that bring life strategies to live a more fulfilling life. This week on the show, we got the one and only Grant Singer. How are you doing, sir? I'm great. I'm, I, I didn't realize we were starting. Oh, yeah. We're amazing. We're live. Okay. Grant, I like you. I think you're cool. I think you're a cool guy. Why, thank you. Hence why you're here. Um, in my own home. In your own home. I've, I've invaded your, your kitchen a bit. It's true. That's all right, though. Yeah, of course. Something that stood out yeah. to me about you. Yes. You carry yourself in a different way. Oh. I don't know if you're aware of it. Bad posture. Oh, well, that could be it. Mm. I mean, I mean, bad postures unite is what I hear. The rounded shoulders, you and me. Exactly. That's us. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> when I met you on set, yes, I loved, you brought your own chair. That is right? true. I loved that. I was like, that's a power move. Full of power moves. Yeah. Secondly, yeah. cop car, cop car on set. Uh-huh. I was freaking out. Yeah. I thought it was super cool. Uh huh. Everybody else, nonchalant. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. love the cop car. I was so freaked out and excited. Same. <laughs> I was like, it was, I don't know why everyone was so chill about it. That's what I'm saying. Like, and I was, I was the one that coordinated it. I, I met with the people. I paid for it. I did all the correspondence. Maybe there's a buildup for you. There was like, maybe. Finally. But I don't know. I was so excited. I got in the back. I you took did. pictures in I the back. I was so jealous that you got to be in it. I was the only person that did that. Anyone could, you should have done that. I wanted to. Next time. I said, yeah. I need a snack. Come bring it to me. Yeah. And I said, fine. Yeah. But loved it. And that's the moment I knew. Mm hmm. Get this guy on a podcast. Yeah. Get this exactly. guy on a podcast. Yeah. Because he is easily amused. Right. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I am amused now. There you go. So you are a writer. I am. You are. Mm-hmm. Of many, many scripts. This is true. Of all the scripts. Mm-hmm. And I got some questions for you. I'd love to answer every single one and maybe a few more. Okay. Yeah. Bonus? If, if, if it comes up. If yeah. We'll time see how it goes. Yeah. And maybe you can even check me for a hernia. I, you know, I'm feeling pretty experienced, so. I mean, you know, two fingers, no gloves. No gloves. <laughs> that's, that's going to be my new Instagram bio. Nice. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yes. So as a, as a writer. Yeah. I'd love to know uh, another thing about you that I think you're, you're great at is I'm just complimenting you less, right? I love it. I Thank think you. you have great self-awareness. Oh. Yeah. Is that true? Well, now I don't know if you're, mm. 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 I think so. I, I, I think that's very important to have as a writer. Right. So when, you, when you're taking a story, yeah. let's say, because you, you can't make yourself every character. No. When you're putting yourself in the shoes of, let's say, a 40-year-old woman. Mm. As one does. As one does. Like, what, what emotional intelligence are you, are you banking on? What empathy are you banking on? That's such a good question. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, for me, I find myself fragmenting as much of my personality into scripts as I can. Mm-hmm. So one character might be one facet of me and one character might be another. Mm. And that's just the ego um, yeah. splitting itself out. Almost like a horcrux, I ah, want to say. A horcrux. Yes. Am I pronouncing that right? I've never heard the word in my life. Oh, okay. Uh, are you familiar with the series Harry Potter? I've heard. I am familiar that it exists. Yeah, it exists. And I have not read any of it. Oh, great. But Thank I saw- goodness. I was really concerned you about that. <laughs> I haven't read them either. I'm not a fan, but I have seen the movies. Same. And they, uh, one of the reasons that it was so hard to kill Voldemort is because he takes his soul and he splits it into seven different objects, which all have to separately be killed before wow. he can be killed. Wow. And that's sort of how I approach characters. <laughs> You're a piece of all of them. I take a piece of myself and I hide it into every person. Mm-hmm. And then each person comes alive in that way because they're a certain part of me, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it's my way of like spreading out my experiences and my, like you said, empathy and emotional intelligence. If I have any, um, I split it into those different people. But at the moment, I'm, I am writing a, a, a story about... A 40-year-old woman. A 40-year-old woman. Is really... I am. Like that is the age? That she's in her early 30s, but 
I mean, it's, I'll take that as that's important. close. Yeah, yeah. And that's been hard, but one thing that's been helpful is talking to people of that age yeah. um, and seeing what it was like to grow up in the place that I was, that I'm setting my story and just doing research is very helpful. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, I've just been hoping that I'm getting it right yeah. and then letting them read it and tell me if I am. It's almost like getting a user experience before you create something. Like when, you, when you're trying to create an application, you give it to the user who actually is going to use it. I suppose that's exactly what it's like. Wow. But I that. don't know. Ah. Because I've never made an app. Same, same. Oh. <laughs> same, same. Do you consistently pull from the same, per or I should ask, what personal experiences do you pull from the most? I usually don't pull from personal experiences. Oh, wow. For like overall story, at least. Small moments yeah. that I find funny that have happened in my life, I might insert into. Toss them in there. Yeah, it might sprinkle them in, you know, like a little spice. But usually overall things come from different places. Hit um, me. Okay, well, for instance, I was inspired by an event that happened to me in, in fall. If I can tell you the story. I would like. love to. Okay. Yeah, I want it more than anything. So one day I woke up and I had an email and it said, service appointment reminder. And I thought to myself, I don't remember scheduling any service appointment, so I opened it up and it was for a Frigidaire refrigerator. Oh, perfect. Uh-huh. And it was addressed to someone named April. Oh. Who lives in Sunnyvale, California. Wow. And her appointment was coming up. Huh. And I thought, that's great, except for a few things. Oh, you're not April. Not April. Do you have that fridge? Nope. Okay. And I don't live in Sunnyvale. Ah. Yeah. Yikes. So those are three big ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just minor details. Yeah. And I thought to myself, if I were a good person, I would try to track down April, track down April <laughs> and tell her that her appointment is coming up. Yeah. Her um, fridge appointment. Yeah. She needs to know. Her that fridge she needs, physical. Yeah, more or less. She needs to know to be home, yeah. to let someone in, all yeah. these things. So first, I decided to call Frigidaire. Wow. Yeah. Dude, good for you. Yeah. Well, the, the, I was going to email them, but it was like, this email is unmonitored. So wow. I was like, okay, I'll have to call them. Do not reply. Yeah, exactly. So I called Frigidaire, and I got a robot, obviously. <sighs> yeah. And the robot said, are you calling about a fridge? And I said, well, yes. Yeah. And I pressed yeah. one. Yeah. And then they said, please tell us the, the, fridge. the serial number yeah. of the fridge you're calling about. And I said... I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not my fridge. Yeah, yeah. And eventually... This is April's fridge. This is absolutely April's fridge. Yeah. Eventually, I get an operator. Oh, thank and I, goodness. I know. I explain the situation. And I say, you know, I'm not April. I'm Grant. I got yeah. this email mistakenly. Yeah. And they said, okay, what's your email? Oh. And I said, uh... <laughs> and I told them, but to me, I thought, that's probably not the solution. Yeah. I think you need to track down April, April. and not... <laughs> Anyway, yeah. so I said, I, this is my email. And they said, okay, you won't get any more emails to that email. And I said, okay. I but guess. is April getting her? I was concerned, but at that point, I didn't you know what else to yeah, do. You, I think I had given up. You gave it yes. your best shot. Yes. So I thought, okay, the problem is over. Yeah. Um, your problem at least over. for me. Yeah. I don't know about April. So some time passes. And then one morning, I get another email. And mm -hmm. it said, your service appointment is here. It's today. Oh. April. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. And I thought to myself, okay, well, clearly my call to Frigidaire did not work. Operator did not care Didn't at all. Didn't care yeah. at all. And then I started to panic because I'm getting all these emails. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I'm getting two to three a week. Wow. wow. I'm starting to get, e this is where, it, this is when it really starts to worry me. Yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. The service appointment passed. Oh, gosh. And I'm still getting reminder emails. Oh, no. For a service appointment from the from that has is that is over. passed. Yes. Oh wow! Actually, the funny thing was that the service appointment was for Halloween. Oh wow! And Halloween Trick or passed. Treat. Yeah. I'm getting them well into November. Oh gosh! Yeah, the for the same, same physical. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh! So then I'm really starting to worry. Yeah. I'm thinking. Is April alive now? What happened to April? Did the fridge fall on April? You Did gotta that? wonder. I'm wondering. Yeah. So. I looked at what information I had. On April or on the fridge? Or on... on everything. Okay. And all I have of this is, are these same emails. And I have her address. Oh. Her confirmed address. Oh my gosh. Yes. Seems That's like a, a big no-no. It seems like a bit of a no-no. But they're yeah. like, we're going to meet you at blank, 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 Sunnyvale, California. 
at this time. Yeah. And I thought, well, I have to go. Oh my I'm going to go to Sunnyvale. Oh my gosh. Which is up near where I am from. Okay. It's near San Francisco. The Bay. Just outside. Yeah, it's in the Bay Area. Is this how you met your wife? Or? This is actually how I met April. Okay. Yeah, April okay. is my wife now. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Unfortunately, I was working at the time, so mm. I could not make the trek. Ah. But I did Google her, April Sunnyvale. I didn't even have her last name. I Googled my email address to see if maybe there had been a mistake. Yeah, correlation. LinkedIn. Found an April in Monterey, it's which close. is close. Northern California, yeah. but yeah. not close enough. I kept going and going and going. And finally, I reverse people searched her address and I found her phone number. Oh my gosh. And I didn't even know if it was connected anymore. Yeah. And I thought to myself, this is it. This is the moment. This is the moment. And I was too scared to call. No. So I, so I texted. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought, I hope she has an iPhone. Yeah. Or a cell phone. Androids. Androids don't get Android's this. Android's fine. <laughs> Android's fine. But I, I typed in the number and it went blue, like for iMessage. Yeah. And I was like, okay. I think we're... We're chilling. It's not a landline. So I said, hi, April. That's it. My name's Grant. And that was it. I was like too scared to say anything more. Um, <laughs> I'm so confused. Okay. Yeah, I was just like, I, I think I was like, is this, am I talking to the right person? Is okay. this April? Okay, okay. And she was just like, yeah, who are you? Like, who are you? Who are you? Yeah. And you said, I'm Grant. And I said, I'm Grant. And she was like, what's yeah, that to yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. And then I explained that I, I sent her a screenshot of the email that I've been getting. And I said, I'm so sorry, but I keep getting these emails. And I was wondering if there's any way... That you could tell them to stop and also your service appointment yeah. is coming up. Yeah. It's actually in the past. Yeah. Fair deal. Yes. Yeah. And she thought it was hilarious. Oh, great. Yes. That's nice. She thought it was very funny. The, the tension was dispelled. <sighs> but she thought it was so funny that she continued to text me. Oh. And I was starting to get confused. Oh. Why she was texting me so much. She was saying, you made my day. I was like, oh, I'm so glad. Well, yeah, anyway, yeah. there you yeah, go. And yeah, she's yeah. like, ha, 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 it's so funny. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. really is. And yeah. I hope maybe the emails will stop now. And she's yeah. like, ha, ha, yeah, I guess, I guess that's true. Anyway, thanks so much for like telling me. And I was like, yeah, yeah okay. No problem, she's yeah. like, you're very funny. And I was like, um, okay, okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, and <laughs> so that's the story. This that's is, like the, the, the crux of the story, okay? Yeah. That's Where's the, the whore of the crux? The whore? Yeah. yeah. That's what you need. Ultimately, I'll give you like the many, like two years later thing, except it was in fall. So I'll give you there like, was m- I'll give oh, you like, wow. and now like oh, we'll, we'll check in you know, yeah, yeah, nine yeah. months later at this stage. So I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. I assume April got her fridge fixed. Okay. I know I no longer got service appointment emails. Thank goodness. But... And this is no. unfortunate. Oh. oh no. I continued to get emails asking me to rate the service that had been provided oh, to me. Oh my gosh. And finally, I just thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the survey. Yeah. And I just filled in like the whole survey, like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. And I was like, all right, <laughs> you filled out fine. Yours. It's fine. I hope the service was good. It's done. And guess what? what? I still get the emails. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Moral. What is the moral? Where I is, don't know. What, what do you? So you're telling me those are the experiences you pull from for writing? Yes, because I found myself in this weird, like post-technology capitalist society thing where I was stuck talking to robots, trying to get something fixed in this bureaucratic nightmare. Yeah, couldn't get April. She's got a fridge that's broken. Yep. Nothing is working. For anybody. For anyone. Yeah. Not me, not her, not Frigidaire. Not Frigidaire. And eventually I thought, okay, what would happen if this hap- if someone was getting these emails and then they decided to go see April? What would that look like? And I re- and that's that is a script that I wrote. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Part of me wonders, do you, I don't want to say go out of your way, but intentionally continue those types of things to get more life experience so that you can write more types of deals does that make sense like you could have hit spam you know yeah that's true but do you do you often find yourself getting into the mix of things definitely for the sake yeah that's awesome absolutely i easily could have gone into gmail yeah and set up a filter and have it directly go to spam you could have but i thought to myself it's not every day that something not an opportunity like that. Yeah, something like this happens. Yeah. And I think what 
what ended up happening was it, it tapped into almost like, I don't know if it's a human nature thing or if it's something that some people have, but for me, I, I could have probably ignored it, mm -hmm. but once I called Frigidaire and I couldn't fix it, then I was like, I'm in. Yeah. I like buckled up. Responsibilities I was like, on you. Mm -hmm. I just thought to myself, it wasn't easy to fix, so now I'm even more invested. Yeah. It, it hooked me. Yeah. If someone were trying to catfish me in a very complicated way, that was the then move. this is the way to do it. I was so <laughs> emails the way I go. was so invested. I told my coworkers, I told friends, I told my family. Oh, that's it. Other people and, now are invested. And you everyone know? was invested. Yeah. Everyone wanted to know. Because they want to know. Who's April? Yeah. What's wrong with their fridge? Yeah. You know, why are all these things happening? Oh, I forgot to mention that April's ice maker wasn't working. That's oh, she was texting gosh. me about it. Like I had something to uh, do with Yeah. Can no, you tell for Absolutely not. <laughs> anyway, ultimately we discovered that our emails were only a few letters different uh, um, and phonetically sounded the same mm. but what are the odds of that yeah i don't know i think i guess at one point she said over the phone her mm. email which is sunset ah uh, uh, i have to edit that out yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Her Every, email. People are gonna hit up April. Yeah, her email sounded like uh, her name, Got and it. my email sounded nothing like her name. Got it. But enough like her name, perhaps over the phone, that someone typing it yeah. would make that mistake. Yeah. And so, yeah, I thought this is a very compelling mystery. Yeah. And this could very well be the beginning of a feature where two guys decide to go investigate. They yeah. go to April's house. April's not there. Where's April? Where's the fridge? Where's the fridge? April's been dead for six years or like oh April's been missing. Yeah. Do you know where April is? Or they show up to April's house and guess what? There are other people looking for April and they think they know yeah. Yeah. where like, April is. It had a big Lebowski feel to right. me of just a couple idiots that are get sucked just into a mystery that does not involve them whatsoever. Yeah, but, but just then they're just in too deep. Exactly. You fall backwards into yeah. a mystery or a, a, some thrilling adventure, which is my favorite kind of comedy. Yeah. People who are unprepared, who accidentally fall into it, yeah. and then they just have to like work it out. Yeah. How fun is that to watch? It's pretty fun, Yeah, I must say. What stories do you care the most about telling? Is it the ones like that where people are just fallen into it or because you, you know there's other genres out there that you, absolutely that you like are. to dip in there are some there are some more um, meaningful stories not to say that april's fridge isn't meaningful but hey, it's meaningful to her yes this is true <laughs> ultimately i decided one direction i wanted to go with april's script was it comes these emails are coming to the main character after he's just gotten out of a, a bad relationship He's just like oh, so a he's, few weeks after a breakup yeah, yeah. and he's feeling sad and he thinks maybe this is fate telling him to go to April yeah. and find love. And that was sort of my way in to, to tell a human story, to tell a story about breakups and fate and how love is weird and yeah. it comes in unexpected places and to just be open to situations like that. And, yeah. and that, that was sort of the, the direction that I took because I think that the films and, and media that I gravitate the most to have a core message like that, but really are just enjoyable pieces to, of entertainment yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that you can do all sorts of things like that with comedy. Do you write in a way where it's like you are aware that you have this underlying tone of love is complicated, you know, or or do you write out those those scenes and then it becomes something like that where it has a message? Yeah, I think you need to from the from pretty early on know what your your truth is at the at the center oh. of it all, what your theme is. Yeah. If you write something without that then maybe you'll find it but you might not yeah, and um, if you don't that's... and if you don't then it, it'll be funny it'll be it'll be enjoyable but it, it won't be memorable yeah it won't kind of stick and i've done it both ways but i do find that it's easier to have something that you start with i interviewed the the sketch comedy group britannic who i've sent you and i mm -hmm. love them dearly um, wow you got to interview them i got to interview them when i was in college because i was a huge fan and they wanted to have some, mm -hmm. I guess, recognition outside of... Or maybe some fan interaction. Yeah, you know, something like that. And I sat down with them and I asked them, you know, how do you approach writing a sketch? Because a lot of their sketches have an absurd spin, but really ultimately come back to, like, a core really funny idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said they start with that kernel of truth. Mm. And it has to be some honest 
situation. One of one of their sketches is called Eagles Turning People into Horses. Wow. Yes, and it was their NYU thesis film. Oh my gosh. Yes. And it's heck of a title. Heck of a title. And it's absolutely the silliest, weirdest, most absurd thing I've ever seen. And it's very long and ridiculous and none of it really makes any sense. But the core that it starts with is how do you get out how do you break up with someone in a nice way and wouldn't you rather do anything other than then. being honest with them yeah. wouldn't you rather like construct an elaborate conspiracy yeah. to make it so that you you have, don't have to tell the truth so you don't yeah. have to tell the truth and when they said that i was like okay that's how you make resonant comedy and maybe even resonant everything yeah it's starting with something that everyone a story that everyone can relate to it works really well for comedy because you can take it to an extreme, you know, which yeah. is what they did. Yeah. Where and they did conduct an elaborate conspiracy. Yeah. To like make it eventually impossible for the two people to stay together. It was like this is not possible anymore. But, we have to break up because of this. Yeah. Um, even though that wasn't actually true. Spoilers. Damn. Um, sorry. Um, ruining their thesis yes. for me. <laughs> I know. So yeah, I think that's. I always think about that. I always try to find what is the truth below all of this and for the april one it's when you're when you've just gotten out of a relationship post breakup everything feels crazy mm -hmm. you feel crazy yep. and you just have to like deal with that and crazy things happen and you go with the flow and yeah. like experience life and that's the best way to like kind of get over it and i'd written it after very recently after breakup so it was oh wow so it was slightly very, yeah biographical basically. and very real mm -hmm. hmm. another thing that i've also heard which i don't know i like I don't know if I like it, my hot take on it. Mm. I've heard people say that all of these stories have been told before. Like, these are all the same stories being retold. And I'm confused, because I'm like, then what makes a story great? Are they all the same? Like, how, do, how does something stand out? Mm -hmm. I guess something to back that up is I watched a movie last night that I thought was so disappointing. Are you able to say it? I don't know. It was on Netflix. I guess yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. yeah. It was called Beats. 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 I, I don't know if it just came on, but I was just so disappointed with the conclusion. It was mm -hmm. like they built this whole story of the main character. Like they, all the characters had very purposeful wants. Mm -hmm. You know, like the main guy just wanted to be successful. Mm -hmm. The kid wanted his mom to be safe. Mm -hmm. The mom wanted his kid to be safe. Mm -hmm. Blah blah blah. But then it was just like. Here's this struggle, blah, 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 and we don't know how to end it, so everybody's okay now. Mm. And I'm like, bummer. Interesting. But back to my original yeah. question is, I mean, that's an example of a bad story, but it's yeah. probably been told before. Yes. What makes a what makes a good story great, and are they repeated? Mm. Are they repeated stories? I mean, it depends how, how granular we want to get. Hit me. All right. Yeah. So I've heard it said before, there's only three stories, like man versus man, man versus woman, and like man versus nature or something. Wow. Yeah. And if you get that like big picture, then yes, there aren't any other things. Yeah. I mean, because you've just... That's it. That's yeah. what stories are, is people interacting. <laughs> With things. With things. Or people. Yes. Yeah. If you want to be that broad, then yes, there's yeah. no such thing as originality. That's, yeah, that's my major concern. Yes. If you want to zoom in a little bit, um, are you familiar with Joseph Campbell? No. Okay. Joseph Campbell is, was a professor oh. of mythology mm -hmm. and also theology. Mm -hmm. And his, uh, his major contribution to culture as we know it is this book, which is based on many of his lectures, which is called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Oh, wow. And he basically goes through a staggering amount of folklore, mythology, religion from mm. all across the world, every culture that you can imagine, um, from history, fairy tales, everything that he can possibly think of. He goes through all those stories and he looks at them and analyzes them and says, here are the things that they all have in common. Every story. Patterns? Patterns, yes. Structural patterns and what makes a hero a hero and that sort of thing. And what he ended up proposing was there's this thing called the monomyth. Monomyth. And it's that there's a hero who goes on a journey looking mm -hmm. for something mm -hmm. and uh, finds it, suffers some consequence. Because he finds it? Or just in general? Sometimes because he finds it, sometimes just unrelated, <laughs> has to change and then returns home. Yeah. That's the monomyth. Yeah. That monomyth was taken famously by George Lucas and turned into the first Star Wars movie. Beautiful. 
Uh -huh. George Lucas was very inspired by Joseph Campbell's work. But you don't have to get so textbook with it. Really, it's just about, you know, you have a main character who wants something, mm -hmm. and they can't get it. So they have to do something, and then ultimately, what's most satisfying to us as an audience is that it changes them, mm -hmm. and then they return home, and they're different. It doesn't have to be a literal return home. Yeah. It's possible that what didn't resonate with you in the film last night was that the change didn't feel either motivated or... Legit, real. Yeah. Sometimes endings like that can feel tacked on. If yeah. some, If someone's suddenly like, oh, and now I am a good person. That's literally what it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that's what happens when you have a story that doesn't have a good enough ending. And they say, okay, well, some, they, I need to change now. So, like, yeah. they change. So and like, change. Yes. Sounds like it was an issue of maybe it wasn't motivated by emotional storytelling yeah. or character or something yeah. like that. If we look at story from that level, then I would say that, yes, stories that resonate with us do follow that yeah. structure. But if you go deeper and closer at a more micro level, I think you can find that there's a, a, a staggering amount of variety. And I don't think that every story has been told. I, I mean, I guess everything has the, has a similar skeleton, mm -hmm. but like humans, that's... Varies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are big skeletons and small ones, and they're all dressed up in different skin. Right. One thing that my friend mentioned was that one of his favorite movies is Taken. Okay. He described it as a father who has to find his child after it's being after his child's been taken away right taken away. yes exactly rescues the child and uh, you know after a series of adventures and all that stuff but it's also the that's finding nemo as well yeah. wow yes so <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah so i would say that finding nemo and taken are very different films i would, I would agree at i their, would <laughs> at their core they are similar on paper i guess you could say yeah but i wouldn't say that the that one exists and the other shouldn't because the other already exists, you know? Right. I mean, if I had seen Taken and I was writing Finding Nemo, I wouldn't say, oh, it already oh, exists now. Yeah, you yeah. know? Great. Now yeah. we can't do it. Now we can't do it. Exactly. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's really about voice mm. and the the world that you build for your story because ultimately what we really gravitate towards is a protagonist who wants something because right. we are those in our own lives. Yeah. And and even our, I mean, Joseph Campbell has this idea of, which I, I've mentioned before and Dan Harmon talks about, it's this idea of a story circle almost. It's, yeah. a, it's a cyclical thing that happens. And our own lives are like that. Our day is cyclical. Yeah. You know, we start, we go do something whether we want to or not, yeah. we have to. Mm -hmm. And then we come home and we're changed in some way. Yeah. And that resonates with us um, as humans. Mm -hmm. You can tell stories that are anti-structure, experimental. I'm trying to think of some, and I can't because... Because it's live, baby. Because it's live, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the show notes. Got it. Um, there will. are many, many examples of movies that don't follow these. And they're great. Yeah. But they won't be emotionally resonant in the same way. They might fill another... What's that one? Requiem for a Dream. Requiem for a Dream. Yeah. Yeah. Is that... Would you consider that, like, experimental? I mean... They both change, but it's for the worse. Is that considered experimental? No, I would say that still follows sort of a, of a structure that we're familiar with. Cool. I would say some. I mean, it's it is an it is a quite upsetting film. Yeah, in there that you go. sense, and they do change for the worse. Yeah, which is allowed in the story structure. Yeah, you don't I have agree. To change for the better, but you just um, have to change. You have to change, and because otherwise it would be rather boring, would it? Not? Yeah, it would. It would be super boring. Yeah, it that's... would be a Squidward. Yeah, going to work, going just... to the mm -hmm. clarinet, going to the thing, going home. I was just gonna say, animation usually follows a more status quo is God formula, where at the end of the episode they return to how they were before, right? Because then they can air it out of order. Oh. I guess that makes sense. Like yeah. Family Guy, Simpsons, yeah. SpongeBob. Because those are just quick entertainment stuff. Exactly. Yeah. If they end up, yeah, I mean, in those cases, you start at one way, you go through a change, and then you end up back where you started, and that way there's it's not serialized. Yeah. But I always find animation to be a little bit unsatisfying because oh, yeah. of that. And I, I mean, it's probably why you feel like you wasted time watching. A little bit. Yeah. And like Stewie from Family Guy is still a child, you know? Still a child, and that's and what will you, always be a child. You know, you know what you're gonna get when you watch those. Yeah, but if you want something a little bit more resonant, then an animated show might be like BoJack Horseman, which yeah. does involve a lot of character work and change and and that sort of thing. What were we talking about? 
Mm, mm. Great question. Yeah. Great question. I mm. think that there's a lot of stories that have yet to be told. Um, because what matters more than the actual structure, I think, is the the actual character. And I think that there's really? so many different kinds of people that you could never possibly repeat. Yes. Because everyone is so complicated, and I'm so different from you. You are. We get along very well. That's but, true. But we're very different. Yeah. And that's beautiful. Yeah. And a story that you could tell would never be the same as the story I could tell. I could tell the story of the fridge service appointment reminder. Right. And then you could tell it as a well. Different way, yeah. And you would tell it a different way oh, if it had happened to you. And that's what makes every story unique mm. if you do it right. Yeah. And that's why I have a little bit of trouble getting into Marvel movies because it is very much the same yeah. thing happening and it's by the same obviously not the same person but Marvel is like yeah. the same voice essentially they have the same brand they have the same everything. yeah but if you a coming of age story in America would look very different from a coming of age story in Africa even though coming of age is ultimately something that we all share yeah so I wouldn't worry so much about a lack of originality if you tell stories that are true for you or true from someone else, then I think that the way you tell is what matters more Yeah. than what you tell. I agree. So when characters take up such an emphasis, do you typically, are they fictional characters to you or do you base them off of people you know? People you know combined with your own personal experience so they have a little fragment of you too? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's all true. It, it's, it's all a mix. Some, sometimes when I start writing something, I'll just steal someone else's fictional character. Oh, really? For instance, I'm writing a sitcom, mm -hmm. and as I've been outlining it, it's been helpful to think of, like, Michael Scott. What would he be like if he were, you know? Yeah, This yeah. is the Michael Scott character, even yeah. though ultimately he'll, like, become his own His own, thing. yeah. But, you know, using other characters as placeholders, so you know what you have a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then you can build it out and make them fresh and new and instill your own personality, and then they live on. But hopefully forever forever even after you're gone who has inspired you the most in regards to who in regards to writing and in regards to creativity mm. because as we discussed yes jack of all trades yes have your hand in everything yes so very creativity important. across the board one very inspiring creative person for me is david lynch hit me i will please do david lynch um you would know his work he made okay. twin peaks and also blue velvet and also the Elephant Man. I've heard of Elephant Man. Okay, <laughs> I'll take that. Those are the big ones. I would Got say. it. And he bases. Oh, also Eraserhead. No, I know Elephant okay, Man. Okay, you know. He bases <laughs> a lot of his work on dreams uh -huh. and subconscious. Oh wow. And he's a huge proponent of transcendental meditation. So a lot of his creativity comes from meditation and the thoughts he's very open to the thoughts that come from his subconscious and that's why his things are very weird yeah but it's beautiful because he's so free and open to that part of himself and allowing these ideas to oh mahal and drive is another great one that he's made you should definitely check it out. i should check him out for um, sure show notes show notes show, show notes, notes show notes, notes, show notes. <laughs> He's super inspiring, and the way that he describes his creative process is really interesting. He used a metaphor that when he's writing something, it feels like he's in a room, mm -hmm. and someone keeps slipping puzzle pieces under the door, and he doesn't know what the puzzle looks like, but every so often he gets another piece, and he has to figure out how he wants to put it together. Yeah. He doesn't, you know, he's no access to that other room. Yeah. And that's sort of his subconscious, slipping him these pieces, and I love that. That is, yeah, that's a great yeah. analogy. So he's very inspiring to me. I would say David Lynch is like a big creative inspiration. In terms of like writing and, and films specifically, I mean, I love Spike Jones, who did Her and some other things. Um, i trying to think who else. Tarantino is obviously classic. Classic. He's very creative. And even going so far back as Alfred Hitchcock. Wow. I mean, his approach to storytelling mm -hmm. is still so much better than most people yeah. even now because he really could understand how to play the audience perfectly he knew exactly what the audience would be thinking at every second and how to manipulate their expectations yeah. and surprise them and suspend them mm -hmm. um, so yeah those are those are some inspirations I would say those are good mm -hmm. something that you said that I think is pretty interesting is he David Lynch yeah he allowed himself to work creatively almost without judgment. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the hardest things yes. to do 
because another quote I heard recently or read or something was like, the hard part isn't writing what you want to write, sitting down to write. And I think a large portion of that, at least in my case, is like self-judgment. Like yeah. what if it's bad? Yeah. Or like just whatever, like not not allowing yourself to be creative. Mm-hmm. Like even, even the script I sent you, mm-hmm. I added it to the message mm-hmm. and then I took it off of the message. So I was like... Because I'm judging myself on this script because I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, I just busted this out. Mm-hmm. He's going to think my max best work is just this 15-minute mm-hmm. thing. There's like all these judgments on your own creativity, yeah. which pretty much snuff is your flame. Yeah. Like I'm glad I did send it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, do you, do, you, do you have something that you do to say, I'm just going to go for it? Or do you allow it to be there and then embrace it and work off of that? Yeah, it's very hard. I, I think a lot of times I get tripped up by my own self-criticism. Yeah. I think it's important to, once you have the idea and you're excited about it, which usually happens at the very beginning of the process. Yeah. You're very excited about it. I would say that's the moment to like try to get in all the worst part of the work, yeah. which is like outlining it, figuring out your characters, setting up your world. Try to do that as fast as possible when you're still excited. Mm -hmm. Because once that excitement goes, it's really hard to follow through and sit down and write it and you're saying to yourself, this is the worst thing I've ever done. Yeah, then you're critical, analytical on it. Exactly. So try to ride that first wave of excitement um, as as much as you can. And then at that point, you have to just be really disciplined and sit down. One of my favorite people is this guy, Austin Cleon, whose book I happen to have wow. in my hand as if I was prepared. Yeah, let's pretend to show it to the camera. Yeah, exactly. There it is. Um, Austin Cleon writes a lot about the creative process. And one thing he has is this, it's called the chart of every project. Hmm. And it starts with your excitement very much at the top. Yep. And then as time passes, it goes down and then about halfway through you say, this is the worst thing I've ever done. Yeah. And then at the end, it's slightly above the, the worst part. And you say, this isn't the worst thing I've ever done, but the next one will be better, and yeah. it's done. Yeah. And that's kind of how you have to look at it. Man, mm-hmm. it's a rough cycle. It is a rough cycle. This is not an easy field that we've picked for ourselves. That's true. I feel like it's the only field, though. Yes. Do you think writers stay up late because of that initial excitement? Like, oh, I better write it now. It's possible. I mean, I... When you're in that state, yeah. you don't want to go to sleep. It's like Christmas morning. Yeah, because you finally got something. Mm-hmm. Bingo. Mm-hmm. Dope. Do you drink a lot of coffee? I don't because it makes me jittery. But if I have to work very long hours in this new job, I probably will start having to drink coffee. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Creamer or black? Black. Mm. That's different. That's serious. Mm. That's when you know. Yeah. If you have the right coffee, it's... It's fine. I mean, my parents get this really good coffee. I think it's called Atlas. Folgers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just about. Um, it has no acid in it, so you can drink it black, and it's really smooth and nice and tastes really good. I have heard that if you can drink the, the coffee black, mm-hmm. it's good coffee. It's good coffee. I have yet to experience that. Well, you'll have to. Yeah. A&PM just doesn't do it for me. Mm. I'm shocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven Eleven can't do it. Not quite. I'll get there though. All right. Yeah, yeah. You'll you'll toughen that tongue up. Uh, I'm trying every day. <laughs> oh, you tell me if this is true. Yeah. I don't feel at home in this world anymore. Sundance, grand jury prize. That's true. What's that about? I was, I, I was there for it. I, I was. I think you maybe looked at my Instagram for that. And I thought it was for sure yours. My film? Yeah. No, no, no. There's a video that I took of that winning. The. <laughs> yes. Got it. Yes, 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 yes. It was my favorite film that year. Oh. And okay. it won, and I was very excited about it. Okay, that's yes. good. If you thought that I made it, I thought you made it. Then that would be a compliment for sure to me. Yeah. Um, but it is on Netflix. If you like to watch it, it's very funny. Got it. I did enjoy it very much. Cool. Yes. I have a question. Yes. You went to USC. Yes. For mm-hmm. film and TV production. That is correct. Bachelor of Arts, baby. Yeah. BA. You're a BA, dude. BA baby. What skills do you think that you've taken from school that really apply to the industry today that you use consistently? Mm. Not too many. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, film school is is very good at teaching people what 
the process of making a movie is mm-hmm. if you are completely in control of it. Um, but the industry is not like that at all. Um, I wouldn't say that I got a lot of practical like industry experience from film school, but it was great to learn the craft of filmmaking at, in film school. That I, makes sense. I learned the trade. I learned how to edit on Avid, which is hard. I learned how to... Practical set, skills. Yes, I learned how to set up lights. I learned some boom. sound editing. Yeah. Boom. For sure, boom. Um, Lots of booming. A lot of booming. Um, you were booming in college. Yeah, I found that when I got into the industry, I was still like... I still had... Um, I learned more from internships mm. um, than anything. They don't really... Cause a lot of... This is not going to be super surprising, I hope, but a lot of the, the professors at in film school are not in the industry because they're teaching teaching yeah um for one reason or another yeah the one professor that i had um got a film into sundance and then she had a kid so she taught film for a while and taught me and now that her kid is like older um she's 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 going back in she just directed a thing for netflix that's awesome yeah it's super awesome but you know they're in they're at school because they something else is going on. Yeah, they need something stable for a while. Yeah, exactly. So they they're not super aware of what's going on. I, I learned yeah. a lot more just once I graduated. I worked in the industry. I saw, oh, okay, this is how things work. But it was great to be in film school and meet the people I met. Jesse obviously is one yeah. of those people. Yeah, I um, And Benedict, I just happened to meet. He wasn't in film school, but I happened to meet him separately. Wow, blessed. And he's like my your go to, my go to guy. Beautiful. Yeah. What is the top, like the pinnacle, or what's the route for a writer? It depends if we're talking film or television. No, you choose. For film, I don't know because you just you write a film and then and then maybe someone will read it someday. It sounds very difficult. For TV, it's a little better. There's actually a ladder. Okay. And it starts with being a writer's PA. Got it. And that is the always always got it. That is the person unless you like somehow. Fina- finagle your skip your somewhere. way into yeah exactly which does happen yeah um, you start as a writer's PA and you assist the writer's room mm-hmm. um, by bringing lunch and all that kind of stuff and then from there you usually move up to writer's assistant which is where you take notes on everything going on in the room and you send out um, those notes at the end of the day and then they read them or they don't yeah um, from there you become a script coordinator right which involves taking all the scripts and making sure all the drafts have all the changes that they want made oh perfect and then sending them out to everybody oh wow and making sure that everyone is up that's to a big date. deal yes yeah. exactly and there's all these revisions that you have to do um, when you're on set especially um, they might change like a location and then everyone needs a new updated script with that yeah so you're in charge of all the ch- uh, page changes um, so that's a lot of work. Yeah. And then from there, if they like you, if you've... Wow. If you've gone through... Yes. You're the hero. That's your journey. Mm-hmm. There's the trial right there. Yes. That's the trial. And then if they like you and you've made it, then you can often be hired as a staff writer on a TV show. Beautiful. And then you're there. Yeah. And then from there, you know, you work your way around TV shows and hopefully you write some good episodes and then people like you and then... You know, you get to write bigger episodes, and then maybe people in the industry are like, "You should have your own TV show." Yeah. So, what do you, what do you know, what do yeah. you want to make? And then you get to get to choose. Yeah, if you're lucky. Boo 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 boo. We're going into the lightning round. Okay, cool. So you're gonna answer as fast as you can. Okay. Favorite book. Phantom Tollbooth. Favorite movie. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The worst experience you've had in a classroom. <laughs> I was in a poetry class. And I had recorded on my phone myself singing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Oh and my. And it accidentally went off. Oh my. And this was high school. Yikes. It actually went off in the quiet poetry class. All of a sudden you could hear oh, no. a recording of me singing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. From your pocket or from your backpack? Uh, from the table, sitting on the table. Oh my. <laughs> so was, there's no way that it was... Yeah. How'd you play that off? Uh, I didn't really. I just paused it and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Beautiful. I got very red. What animal do you relate to most? Seal. Um, <laughs> ice cream flavor? Strawberry. Favorite beach? Anything in Malibu. Okay. Quiet. Where do you go to clear your head? Any high place. Really? Like rooftops, mountaintops, tabletops. Dang. Yeah. Bikini tops. I, Yay. I like to be high up. Okay. Yeah. What's the most exhilarating experience you've had? Um, I used to sneak into award shows 
No way. Yeah, back in college. Like, we talking big ones? I snuck into the American Music Awards. Oh my snuck gosh. into the iHeartRadio Music Awards. Oh my gosh. I snuck into the SAG Awards. Oh my gosh. Um, never snuck into the What's Oscars. your freaking strategy? To wear a suit and tie. To wear a suit and tie. And they check credentials. So uh, my friend and I would go on Instagram the day of and look at people who were like, just got my like... Credential, whatever. Credential. And then I would take that into Photoshop and oh recreate my. it. And then we print it on glossy photo paper. Heck yeah. And bind it and laminate it. And then we had we bought lanyards and just punched them and you know made made the credentials basically forged credentials. That's beautiful. And they look very real. That was actually something that was almost as fun as going to the show was the the fun of getting every detail right of the credentials. Yeah. And then we would yeah, we would sneak into the award shows and that was absolutely exhilarating when you it sounds exhilarating. When you go past security, you it's take your flesh. stuff out of your pockets, you go through, they look at your credential and you go in. Oh my god. They gosh. let you in. That's amazing. And it's very exhilarating cuz you've done it, you've snuck in. You made it. Yeah. I imagine that's a very just just got out of prison feeling. A little bit, yeah. It feels like can't touch me. I'm I belong here. That's the lightning round. Thank Excellent. you for being part of the lightning round. It's been very fun. Grant, thanks for being on the show. It's yes. been an absolute pleasure. Yes. Thank you for having me. Oh. It's, it's been a pleasure for me. Anytime. What is, what's the life strategy from, from this podcast? Always know what you're getting into when you go to a physical. Mm, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. Mine's going to be originality is still possible. Oh. That's mine, yeah. Mine. That's a better one. Well, mine has a little bit of hope. Yeah. But yours is, yours is a practical. Practical, practical. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is just as important. Mm-hmm. Okay, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me uh, at twitter.com slash grantsinger. Love it. That's the best place to find me. Cool. Yeah. You can also find me at vimeo.com slash grantsinger. Love it. But Should I use my browser for twitter.com or? You can also just find me on your on your Twitter mobile app. Oh, really? Um, I am at Grant Singer. Beautiful. Yes. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Grant. Bye. Bye. Bye.